Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today and welcome to the Refugee Welcome Collective Lunch and Learn series. In these sessions, uh, we aim to bring you interesting and timely information, whether you are a volunteer, a community sponsor, or resettlement agency staff, a local advocate, or someone uh, who's interested in learning more. So we really hope that you enjoy today's session and what could be more timely than weatherization, right? As the weather's getting uh, much colder and various parts throughout the country. Um, <clears throat> so this has ways a, a, a quick background. Uh, if you're not familiar, Refugee Welcome Collective collaborates with partners to provide in-depth training programs, weekly learning sessions, resources, and on-demand technical assistance for sponsors, resettlement agency staff, refugees paired with sponsors, community and institutional partners, and others to support quality community sponsorship programs across the United States. So if we can go to the next slide, um, just for uh, some housekeeping, as a reminder for everyone joining us today, um, everyone on today's webinar is automatically muted. And But if you have any tech issues, please submit a question in the questions uh, in the chat so that we can assist you. And if you have any questions during this presentation, please feel free to add those in the chat as well. And of course, there will be time at the end for uh, Q&A. Um, and additionally, this presentation, which is being recorded, and any resources that are mentioned um, will be sent to everyone following today's webinar. Um, so with that, that brings us to our presenter today. We're very fortunate to have Lynette Pearl, Senior Program Officer of Housing with Refugee Housing Solutions, which is a leading national technical assistance provider, provides resources and training and support for resettlement practitioners, landlords, property owners, and refugees to expand access to quality housing for refugee families and newcomers. Um, so very, very happy to have you here, Lynette, and I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Oh, still muted, Lynette. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Thank you, David, for that introduction. And as you stated, it's very timely. So let's just jump right into this, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And can you guys see my presentation? You can't. Let's try this one more time. Um, Again, forgive me, I am not tech savvy, but I'll get, I'll figure it out. <laughs> Share. There we go, we're getting slowly but surely. Can you guys see my screen? It, it did, ah, uh, now I do, yes. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and skip over the intro since David did such a great job introducing who we are and what we offer. But I do want to point out that, like David stated, we do provide technical assistance not just to newcomers and refu uh, to newcomers and refugees, but we also provide TA to sponsors and volunteers. So let's go ahead and jump in because we have a lot of material today. So one thing there is, there is a misperception about weatherization. Um, this is weatherization, it can be an energy efficient process and it's not limited to those who only live in homes. Um, fortunately, renting does not limit a tenant's ability to control the energy use in a rental property. So regardless, if you're working with a client that has a home and apartment, there are things that you can do to weatherize. So our learning objectives for today is we're going to know the definition of weatherization. And we're going to find out some tips on how to do it both summer and winter months. And I'm also going to share some energy saving practices. And what's really in, uh, what's really important with weatherization, um, there are some things that your client can be doing. However, um, I'm gonna talk about some things that a landlord should be doing to the unit or the home as well. And then we're gonna talk about some weatherization assistant programs, just in case you have a client that falls in a little bit of trouble, how can you trigger assistance for utilities? So what is weatherization? Um, weatherization can also be called weatherproofing. Um, it protects a home's interior from outside illness like moisture, 
cold air in winter, hot, humid air in summer, and even sun and snow and ice damage, depending on where you live at. Um, so when you think of how it works, it just think of it as a layer of protection around a home or an apartment that makes it safer and more comfortable regardless of the season. So why is this so important outside of saving money? Well, um, the non-energy benefits of weatherization is health. Um, proper weatherproofing can improve the air quality in the home or the apartment. Um, when indoor ventilation and air quality are addressed, um, air allergens such as uh, pest, mold, and dust mites can be negated. And this can help populations, uh, especially those with pre-existing medical conditions. Um, I do know my daughter, when she was younger, she still deals with asthma. Um, so it was very important at that time when she was younger to make sure I weatherproof our house um, so her pre-existing asthma um, condition would not be flared. So homes and apartments that are cool or too cold or too hot, they can trigger uh, clients with pre-existing medical conditions or they can create illness. Um, so when you think about weatherization, think beyond just saving money. Um, whether, weatherization benefits everyone also in the household. Again, especially since populations are sensitive to extreme temperatures, such as if you have a household that has the elderly, uh, pregnant women and those with disabilities. Um, they will even benefit more from this. Um, a weatherized home or unit, it does reduce fatigue, anxiety, and stress, which includes sleep, re uh, resulting in fewer sick days, uh, missing work, school days, and it does decrease emergency room visits and hospitalization. So you'd be surprised how weatherization affects so many aspects of social determinants of health. So even though we wish it was summer, uh, depending on where you live at, but there are some things you can do. Um, when people think of weatherization, when you're, like I said, winter usually comes to mind. Again, weatherization is weatherproofing. Um, it is a systematic practice of protecting the building and its interior from the elements of every season. Um, so in this webinar section, I'm gonna go over some energy saving tips and weatherization practices that can keep a home or unit cool during the summer. Then later I'm going to go into the winter as well. So what are some practical ways to keep an apartment or house cool during the summer? Well, if available, you can use or have the landlord install a, pro a, program a programmable thermostat in order to adjust the temperature accordingly when no one is home. Um, I do recommend using thermostats program, uh, programmable, ther please forgive me, I'm stumbling with those words, th thermostats for households um, with consistent schedules and inclined to adjust the unit or home temperature. With these thermostats, either you can set it and forget it, and or if the person is tech savvy enough to program it or reprogram it in a way to be very efficient. So if you're dealing with a household that's not tech savvy, such as myself, um, I recommend that you have a case manager come in or the landlord to help program the thermostat. Another thing is blackout curtains. Um, blackout curtains, they are a great way to weatherize a space because they do have a dual purpose. Um, during the winter, the curtains can trap the heat in and keep it out in the summer. And also, it's a low cost to purchase blackout curtains. Keeping blinds closed on hot days, um, it will reduce the room's temperature. When the outside temperature is hotter, um, closing blinds earlier in the day before the sun comes out, it does minimize the heat entering the home or the apartment. And some of these tips, you can share those during um, your training with clients, especially if you're moving in, how they can keep their uh, unit efficient during the summer. And that's the one thing is the blinds. One thing also too, people don't realize is using a dehumidifier. Um, during the summer months, it does reduce the air's moisture, which improves air quality in the home. And it does eliminate potential allergens like mold and mildew. And if you wanna learn more about the benefits of a dehumidifier, and how to select a proper size for a space, you can go to energystar.gov for additional um, information. Um, also using fans. Um, ceiling fans are the most versatile home appliance, regardless of the season, um, one can use for weatherization. Um, by simply just changing the fan's direction, um, the, airport, the airflow can be either cool or warm, the fan direction should be counterclockwise for summer months, which creates a downdraft that makes a direct cooling breeze. 
And in winter months, the fan direction needs to go clockwise in order to create a warm updraft in the room. So also ceiling fans should be turned off when the room is empty to save energy. One thing my grandma would say to me, fans are meant for uh, cooling people off and not cooling the room. Um, also, if there is a fan in the bathroom, it should be used to remove heat and humidity after showering or bathing. And also a kitchen exhaust fan can be used after uh, cooking to pull hot air and moisture out of the home or unit. And these are again, tips you can teach during the cultural orientation. Another thing that's really obvious is closed doors on unused rooms. Um, by closing doors to unused rooms, you can, during the hottest parts of the day, you can cool air flow where it is needed. So we can also talk about vents. You wanna make sure vents are open and not blocked by furniture or anything else. Um, one of the things too that is cost effective, people don't realize is using cotton sheets. One way to stay cool at night and minimize using an AC is to have the right type of sheets. Um, synthetic and flannel should be swapped out for cotton because cotton sheets, they are cooler, they're breathable and can keep moisture from the skin. Another thing that's cost effective is by adding live plants if you have a green thumb. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't. But adding live plants is a natural way to enhance air quality and keep a home and apartment cooler in the summer. Live plants can also help a house and apartment cool because plants lose water during the transpiration, which cools the air around the plants, leaving it purified and fresh. Um, also, plants absorb carbon dioxide and releases oxygen, which help remove toxins from the air. Again, if you're dealing with someone in a house who has a, a breathing issue, like I stated earlier, my daughter um, has asthma. So I always kept plants around, but also I had to have my mom come take care of them because I'm not a green thumb. But it is a very good thing to add to a household. Another thing is run appliances at night um, to save money and energy consumption during the summer. It is recommended that certain appliances are run after peak hours, depending where you live. Peak hours do depend on where you live and the energy provider as well. Um, during the summer, some utility companies, they do do upcharges for electricity use during surges. Um, running a full load of dishwasher or washer or dryer early in the morning or late at night is the best way to avoid surges. And an electro, uh, electric dryer and dishwasher does consume a lot of energy and generates a lot of heat. So if possible, air drying laundry and hand washing dishes should be an option. In addition, running appliances during the day, uh, it does warm up the house and adds to the sun, heating it, causing the air uh, AC to overexert itself. Another thing that is, if it's possible, is cooking and baking. It does heat up home and competes with the AC. So if there is an outdoor area with grills in the apartment complex, or if your landlord allows it, um, this should be used possibly to prepare meals during the cooler part of the day or cook meals in advance if cooking outdoors is not an option. Um, use appliances that require little electricity and releases less heat. And designate a cool room. You can determine which room should be a cool room by closing all internal doors during the day. And the room that is the coolest during the heat of the day should be the designated cool room for family to hang out. So um, another energy saving practice is turning lights off when not in use. Um, I know it's kind of difficult when you have little ones who like to flip all the lights on in the house. Um, studies have shown that um, $900 a year is wasted. Again, that's almost $1,000 is wasted on lights being left on in unattended rooms. And re replacing incandescent lights with LED uh, bulbs. Now, LED bulbs, they are more energy efficient. Um, LED lights produce le little heat and do not contain mercury. Um, they do last up to a thousand hours longer, which is 50 times that of a, a, of a regular bulb. Um, LED bulbs are a little bit pricey, but because of the benefits, there are some government power companies that will subsidize and or provide lighting rebates. And um, here is a screenshot of bird dog lighting. And here's a list 
of LED light rebate programs by state. And again, like David said, all this material will be provided to you. So I highly recommend that you go to uh, your actual state to see what kind of rebates that you can get to get LED lights. One another thing we can talk about, we're gonna finish up the summer is insulating, uh, insulating switch and outlights. Um, insulating sealers is the easiest and most cost-effective weatherization project. By simply installing sealers on light switches and electro outlets, um, you can reduce cold drafts during the winter and keep cool air out from escaping in the summer. Again, this could be a great activity to do during cultural orientation to show uh, clients how to do this. Um, and also when you're how, uh, inspecting a household before they do the move-in, maybe possibly doing some of this as well as part of the move-in process. Um, again, that would be depending on how much time you have. It would be done with the windows as well. Um, most people think of insulation as something for keeping the heat in during the winter, but with the right technique, it can help keep living spaces cool during the summer as well. Um, a tenant can insulate windows by applying window film and weather strips. Now, I do want to add a caveat to this. I will not recommend doing this to windows, um, putting the plastic on windows if it's not properly done, if you have children under a certain age, because children can get caught up in the plastic. So I want to add that, that disclaimer. So we have talked about summer, so let's go into winter, because that's what we're entering right now. So as stated earlier, insulation keeps heat in the home or apartment um, during the summer and cool it, but it also can help during the winter time by adding that extra layer of protective plastic to the inside of the window, it can prevent uh, drafts. Again, I want to make sure I keep repeating this. However, plastic needs to be properly installed and secure when using as insulation, especially if there are children in the home. Um, if, younger, if younger children are present in the home, I recommend shrink wrap covering. It's not a good idea due to the dangers of risk of suffocation, but you can go to window strips. That would be a better option. And here is a brief video by Ace Hardware on how to properly insulate a window with insulation kit. Think window film insulating kit. Let me show you how it's done. Window insulating kits come in a lot of sizes and quantities, so pay attention to how many windows you want to do because while this is a single pack unit, some come in three packs, even five packs. You also want to pay attention to the sizing to make sure that the opening that you have here, that the plastic inside of it will fit. Now when it comes to putting a window insulating kit on a window like this, you've got a couple of choices. You can see the frame of the window here you could apply the insulating kit to the inside, but if you're experiencing drafts or you feel something between this and the actual jam of the window, you may want to go on the face of the trim, which is what I'm going to do. The single most important thing that you have to do before putting a window film kit on is make sure the window is closed and locked. That way, you know that it's as tight as it can possibly be before you put the plastic on. All right, let's get started. Since we're going to go on the face of this trim, I've just got a, a damp paper towel here to actually have a little window cleaner on it so that the double-sided tape that's going to get applied here sticks. Okay, the kit comes with double-sided tape, and we're going to actually picture frame the window with the double-sided tape. Just kind of line that up as straight as you possibly can. Bring it all the way down, pushing against the part that's going to adhere to the trim itself. Then down here, I'm going to take a little utility knife carefully and just cut a little bit of that excess off. Try not to push too hard because you don't want to damage your trim. I'm going to line that up at the base of it because remember that I have to peel the back side of this tape off. And bring that across. And at this end, I'm going to cut it just as I did with the other piece with the utility knife ever so slightly and remove it. And I'm going to go all the way around the window. Okay, so now we take the plastic 
kind of spread that out and orient it according to the window. And you want to just sort of line this up. You don't have to be super precise here. We just got to make sure that you set it up so that you don't have it cockeyed. So as you come down to the bottom, it doesn't stick. So what I want to do is go to this top corner and set that and then come to the side here. And you know, if you don't push too hard, you can sort of peel it away a little bit and then line up the side, push that in place, come across the top. And kind of pull it as taut as you can, but it doesn't have to be super tight because the hair dryer is going to do all that work now. All right, now we push that on. And now we're ready to hit it with the hair dryer. Okay, any hair dryer would do. Try to stay away from using the high setting because you don't want to burn a hole in the plastic. So I'm going to turn it on low, on warm. And then you just start in one corner. You're probably going to keep the hair dryer about six to eight inches away. And you'll see as you do it, it starts to tighten up. It takes a few minutes, but when this is done properly, the plastic should be so tight that you can, bear, you can see right through it. And that's it. If you need more information, just go to our website, acehardware.com, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Better yet. So hopefully the video uh, helps you out a little bit. So let's keep going. Um, be sure storm windows and doors are closed. Um, if the home and apartment has storm windows and doors, make sure they are closed and secure. Closed storm windows and doors provide additional insulation, which uh, reduces energy cost. And block drafts coming through window sills and below doors. Um, drafts from window sills and doors can be blocked with several options. Um, with window sills, again, plastic weather stripping thermal curtains and blinds. One thing that I learned uh, a mommy tip is nail polish can also be used to seal uh, small gaps around the window frame. Um, when using the nail polish, ensure that it's a color that is clear so it's unnoticeable once it dries. Um, door drafts can be blocked with foam tape to help with the seal, door sweeps or a door draft stopper. And just simply let the sun shine in during the day. Um, one of the easiest things to do in the winter is letting the sun do the heating. Um, keeping the blinds or curtains open throughout the day allows the natural sun to heat the home or an apartment. And by closing them at the end of the day, it traps the heat. Um, one thing you can also do that's cost effective is put rugs on floors. Um, since they insulate the floors and stop heat loss, rugs increase the temperature of our space. And rugs and carpets are also significantly cozier than hardware and tile flooring. Um, large area rugs offer high insulation and better heat loss reduction in smaller in smaller ones. So also the warmth of rugs helps keep feet warm and dry. Another thing you can do that's cost effective: um, hang uh, hang fabric as decorations. Although walls do not transfer energy as quickly as windows, they still can release considerable amount of heat. So hanging fabric decorations, pictures, mirrors, uh, bookshelves, and other types of things on the wall can also act as insulators. Um, a humidifier, it does keep uh, humidity levels up during the winter. It's good for the residents' health, and it does benefit the air and furniture as well. It also keeps the air temperature warmer than dry air, so the thermostat can be turned down. And also, again, have a designated warm room and let others be colder. This can be especially helpful during emergencies during winter in a designated well-insulated room as a warming place. Another cost-effective thing is to wear extra layers of clothing and use extra blankets on beds at night. By layering with clothing, clothing and using extra blankets at night, um, a client can stay warmer. When it comes to being warm or winter nights, the goal is to control the warmth trapped by clothes and blankets. And that means that layers 
closest to the skin are the most important when layering clothing and selecting blankets. Another thing that you'd be surprised, a lot of people, you need to make sure that um, furniture, uh, ensuring that furniture or personal items are not blocking vents. Um, a heating and cooling equipment is set up to accommodate a home and apartment specific square footage. So when air vents are blocked by furniture or objects, that same amount of air is still pushed through the ventilation system, but now with increased pressure because of limited opportunities so for airflow. So this can also be a, a fire hazard as well. So make sure if you're talking to clients about weather, weatherizing their homes, especially in wintertime, making sure vents are not being blocked. So we're gonna when when renting, it is often difficult to know when the landlord's responsible responsibilities end and where theirs begin. So regarding weatherization, so as the season change, the question becomes more pressing. Um, some weatherization is more extensive and should be the responsibility of the landlord. In landlord and tenant relationship, this is a partnership. So it's very imperative that the resident works with the landlord to complete the weatherization process. So again, what is the landlord responsible for? And sometimes um, I do recommend this um, if you're with a, a, a client before the lease up, this question should come up during the lease up process before you're leasing or before you're signing a lease. You should ask the landlord, especially if uh, you're located in an area where the seasons drastically change, who's gonna be responsible for the weather, uh, weatherization what is the client supposed to do and what you as a landlord is going to do as well? So anything that's repaired in any exterior and interior cracks, that is the landlord's responsibility. Now, sealed leaking windows, even though a resident can do some basic sealing, it is the ultimate responsibility of the landlord to have windows winter, uh, winterized or replaced. Um, the insulation, H H I H HVAC ducts, water heaters, especially water pipes with quality materials. Um, residents can also protect the pipes from freezing by leaving the sink on a low drip. But ultimately, um, this is the landlord's responsibility is to prepare, especially in a home, prepare pipes, um, ducts, and also water heaters for uh, winter months. Another thing is clean uh, chimneys. This is a landlord's responsibility, especially if there's chimneys and there's a fireplace. And to make sure furnace filters are replaced regularly um, during the coldest months, furnace filters need to be replaced more frequently. Um, I have seen um, some landlords make the client or the tenant responsible for uh, replacing the filters. If so, this needs to be discussed during the lease up. And also the landlord should be properly showing um, the tenant how to actually do the filter replace, uh, replacements. When I lived in an apartment, that was part of my responsibilities. However, the landlord gave me a schedule, but also uh, showed me how to replace the filters. We talked about a programmable thermostat by installing one in the home in an apartment, the renter can save money. Again, if this is um, not available, but if you discuss it with their landlord and they're willing to do that, they should be responsible for installing the thermostat. Cleaning and inspect the roof gutters. Um, a landlord should inspect and clean the roof and gutters before winter hits, especially if a client is in a home. A room and gutters full of leaves or debris can result in basement flooding if there is a basement, but also it can breed pest and water damage that can affect the resident's health. Again, replacing air filters. This should be discussed uh, before the lease up, who's gonna be responsible for it, who's gonna provide the material, and if it's the tenant, the landlord should show the tenant how to replace the air, air filters. And cleaning vents, that is a landlord's responsibility. And anything that's preventative maintenance, a landlord should be proactive in providing that service. So we're gonna talk about some safety tips that I have found when I was a case manager that um, I needed to go over with uh, clients. One thing is you need to explain to clients, do not use an oven as a space, he a space heater or a gas electric oven or surface unit should not be used for heating. Um, a gas oven may go out or burn inefficiently leading to carbon monoxide poisoning. 
um, with an Electra oven was not designed for space heating. Um, use space heaters only as directed. If there's some concerns when a client has a space heater, go over the directions with them, how to use it properly. Um, check smoke and see, uh, CO2 al alarms monthly to ensure they are working properly. Um, when I was a housing specialist, I always went over that with my uh, with my clients during the move in. But also, I did quarterly checks with them. Or at the time, I lived in Chicago, so we had drastic weather changes. So I would prepare them to weatherize their units or home. And this is one thing we always check was the smoke det detectors and CO two alarms. Another thing I would find with clients, and I always would go over is using candles safely. And to explain to them, candles should never be used as a heating, heating source or left untended or burning while sleeping. Um, if I had a household with children, I recommend they never use candles. And one thing I also did with my clients, I helped them create an emergency kit just in case if there was a power outage. Um, with emergency kits, it should be available. A basic kit should include water, non-perishable foods for several days, battery powder radio, a flash up medication, and a first aid kit if assistance is needed. Um, if there is um, some issues with getting those materials, one thing you can do, you can um, refer your client to the American Red Cross site. They do have a preparedness checklist, but also sometimes depending on the American Red Cross affiliate, they do give out these actual emergency kits. Now I wanna, I know we're talking about weather, weatherizing our homes, but also in how in apartments, I also recommend there's two emergency kits, one for the house and also have one for their car. Now, if there is a member in a household that relies on medical equipment that requires electricity, I recommend as soon as possible, you get them leased up, find out who the actual utility provider is and get that family registered with the provider with their medical documentation. Um, again, if you have a household and it's known that a family member needs a piece of medical equipment that requires electricity, help them notify that utility provider that, that what their uh, medical condition is and why um, electricity cannot be cut off in the home, especially during um, winter months or hot summer months. And we'll talk about that later in the uh, webinar. And we're going to go to how to save money right quickly. Unplug appliances. A person can save up to 10% utilities by unplugging unused appliances. Um, preheat the oven only or stove when necessary and use the oven at a constant temperature. And then if possible, bathe instead of showering. And then if this is available uh, with the utility provider, uh, have the client participate in a monthly average budget plan um, this is when a budget plan, a resident can pay a set monthly amount for utilities. This service makes energy costs more predictable despite fluctuations in energy use as a, a season change. Um, I do want to add this as a best practice. Now, if it's a smaller household, I would not recommend using this because again, how they come up with this uh, amount is based on the previous uh, tenant. Um, so if there's a previous tenant with a larger household, the bill average is going to be larger. So I would not recommend doing this monthly budget plan if it's a smaller household that you're, is, is leasing up. So we're going to talk about the different weatherization assistant programs. And the primary purpose of one of the biggest one is the Department of Energy Weatherization Assistant Program. Um, it is to increase energy efficiency for low-income households while reducing the burden and hope energy costs on uh, low-income families. So why is it important? So um, we call it the National WAP. It's important because it does help communities be vital in a system and revitalizing themselves by making houses and apartments livable, livable safe for low-income families. So we're gonna talk about Low Income Home Energy Assistant Program. It is United States Federal Social Service Program that assists low income households with energy costs. And these are costs that can be associated with home energy bills, um, energy crisis, weatherization, and minor energy related home repairs. Now with this program, it can help households stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer. So it's year round, long funding is provided. And if a household qualifies for this program and receive assistance, Payments are generally made directly to the utility company or the fuel provider. 
Now to apply for this assistance, the household would need to go through the contracted agency. And most uh, contracted agencies can be a community action agency, um, which we call CAAs, and they can be local, private, or a public nonprofit organization. So um, these agencies help low-income households to help themselves in achieving self-sufficiency. And then also a household can also call 211 to locate energy assistance programs in their geographic area. Now, this is a snapshot um, of uh, LIHEAP map state and territory contact listing. Again, this will be provided for you. So you can simply go to a, you know, your state, you can hit that specific area, and it will show you a list of those uh, agencies that do provide weatherization assistance. And one of the key things you're like, okay, that's great, but how do you apply and how do you find a weatherization agency? Um, typically, again, it depends on where you live at. I have seen some uh, weatherization assistance be done through nonprofits such as Salvation Army, um, Catholic Charities, or it could be through the city or county. Again, it varies depending on where you live at. And here are the common things that they look for in eligibility requirements. Of course, you have the household has to be a low income household. The actual must reside that the person who's applying and is responsible for their utility bill must reside in that specific household and at the time of application must be 18 or over when applying. Um, so this is just common eligibility requirements. Some have additional requirements. I just wanna go over the common ones. And then this is what they kind of look for when uh, an application. So if you have a client that wants to apply for assistance, again, find out who that contract agency is and they should have a list of documentation that is required in order to fill the application out. And it's very important that you read that list properly if you're helping a client to fill it out, because if there's one missed piece of documentation, guess what? The application will not go through and you've got to get an application in quickly if you want them to receive assistance. And usually they want legal identification, of course, account and billing information to make sure the person who's applying, um, their name is on that actual utility bill. And then of course, this uh, program is for low-income families, so income verification proof if they're working of all people under uh, adults in the household. So anybody in the household over the age of 18, they will have to provide uh, proof of income to make sure, again, it's a low-income household and a copy of the lease. So again, they might require additional documentation, but this is typical. And one thing I want to discuss, which is really important, uh, David, am I good on time? Because I'm not paying attention to time. I think you're doing well. We can usually wrap up no later than 1245 and we'll have some time for Q&A. Okay. So one thing I want to talk about is the state disconnection policies. And most states do have laws, rules, and regulations in place that determine when electric, gas, water, or utility company can disconnect a com customer service. So the rules and laws, they do may prevent a shutoff of the heat and the utilities. And these do, I want to say this, these laws do vary by state. So it's very important that you find out what your state disconnection um, policy and procedures are. Um, there's the first one, which is called the hot weather rule. And this is when the National Weather Service predicts during certain months, if temperatures rise above a certain level or degree, services cannot be disconnected or shut off. Now, again, this rule does vary by state, and I, I'm an example type of person. So, for example, I live in the state of Missouri, and so our, our, our weather rule starts between June 1st and September 30th for the hot weather rule. And it does vary, and it does change each year, so it's very important if you're working with a client and you want to know what the hot weather rule is, check yearly to see if anything has changed with your state. And so the hot weather rule here in Missouri, it's it starts at our June 1st and in September 30th. And then it kind of outlines what the conditions of when uh, a provider can cut off service or when they can't cut off service. Again, it varies depending on your state. And the similar thing is with the cold weather rule. It's similar to the hot weather rule. Um, utility companies cannot turn off utilities and certain services if it's going to be a certain temperature. Again, here in the state of Missouri, our cold weather rule, it starts, it's effective, it's already started November 1st, and it ends March 31st. 
One thing I want to point out, we talked about earlier, if you know that there's a household with a medical, uh, a medical condition or medical necessities, um, it's very important that that, uh, that client is, 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 uh, is listed with that utility company, because if the utility company knows and that household is registered as having a medical necessity due to that client has actual, um, equipment that electricity is needed, then they have to hold off turning out, turning off utilities. So that's why it's very important once you get a family leased up and you realize, oh, I have grandmother that's on um, oxygen tank or on something that requires electricity. I'm going to find out who that actual utility provider is they have. And I'm going to, with the permission of the, of the, the household, I'm going to get a letter from the doctor. So just in case if they fall behind on their utilities, we'll make sure that um, nothing gets cut off due to uh, that household's medical requirements. And then we're going to talk about landlord's responsibilities for utilities because it always doesn't fall on the tenant. So if the landlord is responsible for utilities and, and the shutoff happens, um, the resident can demand that the landlord pay the bill immediately. And if they say they will pay it, ask the resident. They need to know when and confirm with what company and get it in writing. So again, I want to point this out. It's very important when you're with a client to read that lease because the lease will outline who's responsible for what utilities. Now, if you have a client that is signing a, a lease that the landlord is responsible for all the utilities and utility gets, gets caught off, guess what? That landlord is responsible for getting them paid. So again, it depends on which state you're, 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 you're living in. And if the landlords are responsible for you, the utilities, um, it tells you what is your recourse for that resident in order to get the utilities turned back on, but also um, can they get their rent reduced at the next month? So again, your state laws will determine that. And I also want to go over uh, reason utilities can be disconnected. Um, um, meter, uh, meter tampering. Um, I lived in Chicago. Hey, it happens. Um, that can get a client if it's detected that the meter has been tampered. The utilities can be disconnected. Um, again, if there's uh, signs of stealing of services or having unsafe conditions and fraudulently applying for services, unfortunately, I've seen this happen. Um, utility companies have every right to cut services off if uh, the application was fraudulent. And here is a brief video of what to do if your, your utilities get cut off. So that was brief. And I am, um, that could close this, this portion of the webinar. Um, again, it was a lot of information. Um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me at lpearl at cwsglobal.org. Or as David mentioned, we do provide technical assistance. Feel free to um, send us uh, a request for TA. We do have a team of experts. So I'm gonna stop sharing and see if there's any questions. And hopefully that was helpful. I kind of try to look at time. <laughs> no, it was very helpful. Thank you. Yes, and at this point, we can take um, take a few minutes if anyone wants to come off um, mute, and camera if also if they're comfortable, no worries if not. And if you have any questions, um, that, was a, that was a great opportunity to ask. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, so that two one one speed dial. Um, so what are some common examples of things they could point us to, and what are some like common situations where we would need to dial them? Now, each two one one, the service varies depending on your area. Like, um, I'm in I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. Our two one one is very robust. Um, you can call two one one; it will direct you to utility assistance, but also to what agency has housing assistance and also mental health. So it depends on your area. So I can't say specifically, um, So, but it is very helpful for guidance on utility assistance. I do know that. They do include that in their 211 service. And if your 211 is not con connected to your not United Way, but most are, again, it depends on your area. United Way is also another provider you can reach out to to get 
some type of direction on what uh, companies are, what contracts, what companies contract out to offer weather assistance for um, low income families. Okay. I hate to say that because it is two one ones. Like my mom is in Chicago, Illinois. Her their two one one system is totally different for our two one one system here. But in general, two one one systems do can direct you to uh, providers that are providing uh, utility assistance. So that is kind of I can safely say that. Okay. And um, is it Francisca? Yes. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me and tell me what area you're located and I can do some research and tell you if you do need that as part of your arsenal for case management. If you have a client that falls into trouble, I can get some information for you. Thank you. And again, depending on where you live at, I highly recommend you find your code rule regulations because they're there if you if you have them for your state they should be in effect by now if okay, you're, living, thank you're, you. you're living in colder states yes mm, thanks any more questions feel free or put it in the chat because <laughs> some people don't like to ask questions that open Oh, yeah, so one more thing, the whole thing about the fans, why do you specify counterclockwise in the summer and clockwise in the winter? What's like the why behind that? Because the direction creates a different flow. Um, one direction creates, creates a, uh, it makes it hotter, the flow, the air it pushes the hot air a certain way, and then the cooler brings the cool air in. Mm. <laughs> Okay, someone says, do you have a list of affordable housing options in front of any chance? Um, I can, I do, there is a list of tax credit properties by state. Um, and also, again, depend on what state you live in, there is some listings where you can find affordable housing. Now, the person asks affordable housing, do you mean affordable in a sense that subsidies attached to it or rent is determined on determined by income? I'm waiting on the response. Oh, okay. Um, if you reach out to me um, and you tell me what state you are, I can help you pull a report. Again, some of these trainings are very vague and the reason why housing, even though there are some common things in housing, depending on your state, you might have additional protections as well. That's why I always try to say, depending on your state. And also when it comes to utilities, again, each state is specifically different what they offer, but in general, I really, and I'm gonna say this too, if you have a client you already know that's on, um, which you guys do, that's on a strict budget and a strict income, even if it's not cold, go ahead and apply for utility assistance. Um, because again, it can be used for not just winter, but for summer too. Because I've seen client clients when I lived in Texas fall into a little bit of trouble because they couldn't keep their utilities up because of air conditioning because it's extremely hot in Dallas. So it's not just for cold weather as well. So a lot of people think, well, I'm going to get utility assistance for winter time. No, if it's hot, there are utility assistance available for when it's very hot too during the summer months, depending on where you live at. Any other questions? Perhaps I'll come in if um, anyone else is still formulating a question, but just to say thank you very much for that presentation and the level of detail and it's very helpful. and. I also appreciate how throughout you were lifting up how a lot of the information covered could also um, be covered in cultural orientation. So I can see this being a really helpful resource um, 
also specifically for volunteers and, and sponsor groups, um, whether they're in the cultural orientation committee or housing committee, um, to take note of this and, and have this as an opportunity for for cultural orientation or just being aware of this when they're when they're visiting and um, yeah, and also just reminded too the importance of being good neighbors. Um, you know, there's certainly a lot of cultural adjustment to living in a new place, but there's also acclimation, like literally to the climate, <laughs> depending where you're coming from. Absolutely. Um, I'm from, I'm a Midwest girl, David. I grew up in Chicago. When I moved to, I remember when I first moved to Texas, it was like mm -hmm. a culture shock to me, the weather. So I can imagine right. someone coming from a different country and I'm coming from a different state. <laughs> So right. yeah, I think you brought that up. <laughs> yeah, and, and good being a good neighbor could be if perhaps we're um kind of attuned to some of the weather weather patterns or we're hearing that there's a big storm on the horizon, just being a good neighbor and checking in, making sure they got what they need, because that could be very, uh, very new and jarring. Um so yeah, I don't know if anyone has any other questions, we have a few minutes left. Um otherwise I'll just point all the participants to the QR code that we have here on this slide, just to say that um, if you're able to scan that and to take the very brief uh, survey, we really want to gather all of your, your feedback. And um, this should also be an opportunity there if you want to have any suggestions on, on topics as well. Um, and again, uh, we will follow up with a with this uh, recording of this, and it will also be posted to the Refugee Law and Collective library where you can find all recordings of previous lunch and learns um, it's a whole range of, of useful topics there um, so other than that we'll say thank you oh and there's also a link in the chat to the to the survey as well thank you very much grace um, so with that we can we can conclude and i hope everyone has a good rest of the week and also a good good holiday season thank you Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.